Okay, I guess my, my computer says that it's time to start. Um, do people agree or is it, uh, am I? Okay, well, the official clock until they fix what's back there is what's on my computer. Um, let's start off, first of all, logistically. Are there any questions? Did people, there was a quiz, correct? Yes. And that worked. Were there any questions about the logistics of the quiz? Or were people able to figure that out? Okay, so that hopefully will become a habit and people will do that, um, you know, uh, basically every day before class. Any, um, and did everybody succeed in getting on? Um, obviously, anyone who submitted the quiz had to have gotten on, I guess, uh, Google Classroom, correct? Okay, if there's any problems on that, if there's any problems on that, definitely talk with the TAs, but I think that that is under control. How many people, is there anybody here who has not yet gotten on Piazza? Okay, no one is saying so. Okay, but I, I don't think there was a lot of action on Piazza. Was there or any questions so far on there? Okay. Okay, so that's where uh, some people have been asking me questions like, oh my God, where do I find the quiz and stuff like that? That is exactly the kind of question you want to ask on Piazza because that's where... Uh, what you call it, because your classmates probably know that, okay? Any questions? Any other questions about logistics? Or from last class or anything like that? Okay. Um, I switched masks because last class I found that, um, actually I gave two lectures on Tuesday and on Thursday, and um, I was wearing out, and so I'm hoping that this will be uh, less horrible to teach in. But um, I, I assume people can see me and hear me and everything's okay, right? Okay, fair enough. Let's say boom. Um, okay, let's, uh, okay, this, I see there's a question here. There are two email IDs, one that says at Stony Brook and one is at cs.stonybrook. Which should you use to submit assignments? At Stony Brook, see how you can ask your students, your fellow students, and they know the answer, okay? And, I, and that's something that I wouldn't know the answer to. So that's why it's a great thing to do that kind of thing on Piazza, okay? Fair enough. Any questions? Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today, I'd like to get into um, the content uh, a little bit today. And I want to talk a little bit more about what data science is and... Uh, how, how to think about things. And I do want to start getting some, hopefully some interaction in class because that, I, that's kind of important to me. And so we'll see how if we succeed in doing that. Um, as I said last time, what is data science? You know, it's kind of something that is sitting at the intersection of um, statistics, okay? And, uh, you know, it's it, it, at the intersection of computer science, okay, and uh, typically some kind of an application domain, okay? So, uh, you know, in, in data science, to, to do something that I consider to be data science, there has to be something you're hoping to learn from the data, okay? And that usually means there's got to be an application there. Um, and this is a kind of cute Venn diagram I stole that I kind of liked that showed that, you know, data science sits at the intersection of these things. Machine learning, okay, one difference between culturally machine learning and data science is that, you know, machine learning doesn't really care about the domains. If you read papers in machine learning, they're very proud to say, look, we work on data sets and we've tried it on 25, our method on 25 data sets and we get these scores. And do I know what the scores mean? No, but my goal is to get a big number, okay? If you're doing something where you're running a, a, an algorithm to build a model so you get a big number, that's machine learning. But if you're trying to get some kind of an understanding of what the data set is telling you for a particular domain, that would be where data science comes in. Any questions? Push back. It's okay to push back or anything like that. I do want there to be discussions or this is going to be a long semester. Okay, let me start out with a couple of philosophical things. When I think about what is the difference between what I think of as computer scientists and data scientists. Um, they differ in, uh, you know, 
in, to a certain, in what they're interested in. They differ in how they think in certain ways. And, um, you know, computer scientists generally don't really, don't naturally appreciate data. I will say it is something that you run through, you know, it's, it's the stuff you run through an algorithm, maybe a machine learning algorithm, but you usually don't really care what the results are. And um, one, one, one test I'd like to make, has anybody here ever um, tried to, you know, evaluate the performance of an algorithm by constructing random, a, a random, use random numbers to generate some kind of a data set, run it through your algorithm so you can tell how fast it is or something like that. Is there anybody who's ever done that? Okay, I see some people switching. Sure, that's a, how do you test computers programs? You, you take, um, often you need some kind of data for it. it, might as well be random numbers, okay? You pump it through your data set and you see if the thing crashes, you see if it. And to a real scientist, that sounds lunatic. You're taking a random numbers, which mean nothing to you, running them through a program and this is science, okay? I mean, you, you know, what are you gonna be learning? You're learning that the program didn't crash. You're learning how fast it is, but you didn't really learn anything about a domain, okay? And um, I think that it, it's a cultural shift to realize that data sets are a scarce resource um, and that you really have to use hard work and imagination to get them, okay? I mean, I. I have wor worked with bio and from, you know, biology people from, from time to time. And you have these biology graduate students who don't, aren't genetically much different than you, okay? But they will live in a lab. They will spend, you know, three weeks doing an experiment, okay? Staying up late and doing these things and come back with saying with one bit of information, the thing lived or it died, okay? And, um, you know, this is a different, if you grew up in this kind of a world, you respect data in a different way than if you're used to passing random numbers through a program and expecting to get complimented for it, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, so I think what I want us to start to think in here is to realize that data is a scarce resource. Um, there are other... Um, you know, differences, I say, between computer scientists and real scientists. Um, one difference is that, um, you know, in computer science, we, we build our own world, okay? Do you guys program on real computers? Or do you program on virtual computers? Even the computer you're using isn't real these days, right? It's some, some part of something sitting somewhere out in in space, okay? Um, you know, computer scientists have computational models that are, you know, that do what they're supposed to do. There is, you know, we, we try to hard to build clean and organized worlds. Real scientists try to understand what the real world is like. And there is messiness, there is error, there is noise. There is a lot of, um, it, 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 it's, it's a different, you know, different kind of issue, you know, um, you know, I have had students come by to me and, you know, you, you run a program and say, wait, your program just crashed. Of course it crashed. It wasn't data that I was expecting, okay? And that's because, again, in computer science, we're expecting, you know, we, we, live, in a, we, we live in a different world than the real world. That's not doesn't make us bad people, but it does have to, we do have to understand that if we're going to um, think about interpreting data properly. The other thing that's true is that in, Mathematics and computer science, every, anything is either true or false. I mean, obviously binary things are true and false, but the correctness of an algorithm is true or false, okay? You know, we live in a mathematical, logical world. And in the real world, nothing is ever, ever completely, you know, completely true or false. You know, and uh, you know, when I would work with these biologists, I would be talking to them and they would explain to me, Oh yeah, this system works like this in, in the cell. And I'll say, they'll, they'll say, oh, does it really work like that? Well, there's also this and this and this. And is that how it works? Well, we don't know how this part works. But so, so the world is a messy thing and we have to kind of embrace that if we're gonna be data scientists. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, 
Another difference, and again, part of this that I kind of said before, is that, um, you know, real scientists are, un, are, are quite comfortable with the idea of um, what you call it, whether data has error or not, okay? Um, that, that biologist who spent a month in the lab to get, uh, an, you know, to get one bit of information, was it alive or dead? What did the advisor probably tell the student? probably said, well, are you sure you didn't mess up the experiment? Go do it again, okay? And that, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons why you might get a negative result on, a, on, on something. And this is one thing that computer scientists don't seem to think about very much. One cultural difference that if you're doing research is, uh, I think, kind of um, profound, is that if you're in a real science area, you are worried about discovering things. There is a world out there and you want to be the first to identify or prove some kind of a phenomena, right? You want to be the first person to figure out how this gene works or the first person to discover America or something like that. But, um, but in computer science, when you're doing research, you're really not discovering things. Computer scientists build things and invent things. Okay, and, um, you know, it makes for a different kind of a culture, okay? If you are a lab scientist, you live your fear, your life in fear that someone is going to discover what you were supposed to be working on, okay? Um, you know, basically before you, you know, okay, now we, we see, okay, people are coming in, settle quickly. Again, as far as the class weather report, for those people who are uh, in TV land, if you have hopes of coming here, people, the, the room's only now filling up. You could beat these people. Not yet, but when we, uh, when we, have the, when we open this up, once we start seeing uh, a little more what, what the flow is here. But like, I remember working on some people to, with, with, with some biologists. We were trying to sequence the genome of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Does anybody here know what Lyme disease is? Okay, Lyme disease used to be the disease you feared on Long Island. Okay, I say used to be because now we have COVID and now this is a first order thing. <laughs> but there is a disease of ticks that, uh, you know, that, that insects that bite and it, 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 gives people, it gives people terrible headaches and it, gives, it, it can be a bad thing. So there was a disease that was discovered not far from here, actually, in Connecticut, but I was working with some biologists here to sequence the genome of that bacteria. And they worked hard for this for two years, getting their technology right. And 10 days before they were done, another group published a genome of, of uh, what you call it, of Lyme disease, of the, of the Borrelia, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And what happened to our group? What do you get for finishing second? Nothing, okay? Will anyone accept your paper for finishing second? No. You shrivel up and, and, and your group dies because you can't get funded, okay? So if you're in the life sciences, you care about discovering things. And discovering things means, you know, being first. And that causes a certain level of paranoia and energy that we don't see here. In computer science, I don't really worry about another group coming before me when I write a paper. Why? Because I'm doing my own kind of thing. It's typically, if we're working on the same problem, we're probably doing it in somewhat different ways. It's not a tragedy when a paper appears while my students are working on something. Okay, very seldom does it really kill what we're doing. Okay, and that's because we're in the invention business more than in the discovery business. Any questions about that? In this class, you are in the discovery business. Okay, any questions? Okay, one difference that I do think that's important when it comes to thinking about data science, there's a difference between, um, I will say, genius and wisdom. Smart people want genius, smart people want wisdom. What is the difference between what genius and wisdom? I will say that, um, you know, if you, you know, when, when I'm, you know, I, in designing algorithms, there are some people who are unbelievably smart and come out with these, you know, 
with, 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 with the right algorithm, they can prove all these fancy things. They are geniuses, okay? Um, genius is in some sense about finding the right answer, the right way to do it, that, that sort of sudden flash of insight to get you uh, to the point that you, you see the problem differently than anybody else. Genius, if you have it, is a good thing, okay? Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom, I claim, is more about trying to, you know, when you listen, talk to someone who's an old person who's wise, you go to the, this, the, you know, these people will often talk about how to avoid doing bad things, how to avoid making mistakes. Avoiding making mistakes is kind of what wisdom is about. Um, it is avoid doing stupid things, okay? And in data science, I claim that unlike, let's say, algorithm design, you take your algorithm design class, you better harness whatever genius you have in you, okay? In here, wisdom matters more, okay? We're gonna, you know, in the course of a data science project, there are often many, many, you know, there's many decisions you have to make. No one of these decisions is going to make the analysis right. But an incredible, but, but a dumb solution at any one step can make your analysis wrong for, you know, from, for, for the rest of the way through. And, you know, there's often, you know, a couple of different ways of doing things that are probably right enough that preserve what's going on. And so it's a little bit of a different way to think of things. Okay, here we're going to want to make sure we understand what we're doing at every step and that we are, you know, not doing something stupid, okay? And, um, it, you know, it makes for, that's one of the reasons why, you know, you know, again, the, the, the way of thinking here is somewhat different. Any questions about it? Any questions about data scientists versus computer scientists? And if any of you want to defend computer scientists, now's a perfectly fine time. So none of you will defend being computer scientists, I guess. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Now, how do you get to be wise? Okay, now, um, one thing that wisdom comes from is humility. So I better not tell you how to be wise, because that, that's not a very humble thing to do. Okay, but of course, as you get older, supposedly you accumulate wisdom. Wisdom, in the form of not making a mistake, often comes from experience. Okay, it comes from having tried to do problems like this, seen where you have gone wrong, and try not to do it the next time. Okay, so that's one thing that I think wisdom is about. Um, wisdom, I think, comes from general knowledge. Okay, you can imagine two kinds of students, equally bright, equally hardworking, one of whom is absolutely focused in a particular area, I am going to become an AI god. I am going to take machine learning class one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Another one who's going to say, well, I'm going to become a general kind of computer scientist. I'm going to make sure I know about compilers and I know about operating systems and algorithms and things like that. In general, I think that wisdom comes from general knowledge. Okay. And so I, I, I kind of encourage kind of broad backgrounds. Okay. Um, Wisdom comes from listening to others, okay? Um, and, you know, again, it's, 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 you know, humility is important. It's important to see how often you're wrong about things. In my algorithms book, I give, uh, and my data science book, I have these war stories, which is where I describe things we worked on. And with many of the war stories, especially in the data science book, I focus on where we did something dumb okay and kind of what the consequences were and one of the reasons is i think it's good to learn from that and it's good to learn from your own mistakes any questions okay still nothing um okay let's keep going but i'm going to do better soon one one you know kind of other moral that i say is that a data scientist is a good data scientist is someone who is curious about the domain that they're working on. Often that domain changes. I'm not saying you're going to become, you know, work in one domain for your whole life and that you got to become an expert. But if you're a good data scientist, you want to, if you're working on 
somebody was talking here about advertising. They had, I guess their job last time was related to doing analysis of web clicks so they would be able to build advertisements. A good data scientist is curious how the advert, you know, the, um, you know, um, the advertisements are the right advertisement is click is linked to the right viewer. Okay, for some of these domains, what are you actually selling? What are these domain things? Actually, the whole internet advertising world is kind of an amazing thing. If you, uh, you know, what you call it, if you think about it, kind of if you go on Google, you click on a web page. Actually, you'll click on a web page if they have the ads done through Google somehow. I mean, there is kind of going to be an auction done before you actually see this ad where, you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of people who are interested in advertising are going to put an, a bid in on what your, you know, what, what they would pay for your, you. And they're trying to pick the best one of these. And, you know, this is happening you know, as I, you know, as my page comes up, there's all this action happening behind the ground scenes. And this is interesting, okay? And any kind of a shop that you work in is usually interesting to the people who know something about it. So one way to tell if you are going to be a good data scientist is whether you talk to people about the domain that you're interested, they're interested in. You know, if you get to a, if you go to a, a cocktail party, I know, you know, you probably don't know how many cocktail parties you go to, but at some point in your life, you will brush up against somebody. Oh, what do you do? I'm a grad student in computer science. What do you do? Well, I'm, I'm an accountant. Okay. And you could either say, my God, that's dull and walk away. Or you can ask them, you know, oh, what do you do? Well, I launder money for the mob. Oh, really? Is that interesting? Okay. Are these nice people? Yeah, they're a lot nicer than you think when you, when, when you talk shop with these people. You can often learn things um, that are interesting. And I do encourage this kind of, of curiosity that, that, you know, this, this I think is an important thing. The other thing that is related to this, how do you develop curiosity? I do think that it is important to read the equivalent of a newspaper. I mean, I know that newspapers have somehow, paper newspapers are not what they used to be. Um, and, and online, you can obviously read online. But reading the fullness of an online newspaper, rather than the um, articles that are just shown to you by, um, you know, by, by the search recommendations, is an empowering thing. It's important to, I think, know about a lot of different things, okay? And... Um, you know, I, I, I right now, I guess my favorite physical thing that I read is this magazine called The Economist. I don't know if any people are familiar with The Economist, okay? And every, every week I get this thing and I learn about, uh, you know, that, there, that there's a shortage of onions in some country in Africa. I learn that, you know, all kinds of strange things. And I think that that's a kind of and things I wouldn't know to look for or Google wouldn't really know to show me because I hadn't proven interest in onions, okay, before, okay? But I do think that's kind of an important thing. So I do recommend everybody read a newspaper every day. Any questions? Okay, that's probably enough lecturing at you, okay? Any questions so far or pushback or discussion? Yes? Another very basic question. So you say that data scientists, instead of you know, being so much into depth, you wanna cover more breadth. Yeah. But if you want to really work in like biology, bioinformatics, wouldn't you be limited to not knowing some of the technicalities that biology entails? Like okay, so this is a question again of depth versus breadth. And, um, you know, if you wanted to be a bio, work in bioinformatics, okay, does knowing um, what you call it, is there a trade off between not knowing as much depth about a field versus kind of trying to know broader? You know, I happen to have been a bioinformatics person for, you know, for, for 20 years now. So I do know a lot of certain kinds of things. I know a lot of, in the areas that I work on tend to be related to DNA sequences and genome analysis and things like that. And I know a lot about that. But be, and a lot of that has come from talking to people, talking to my favorite biologist. Okay. I have a favorite yeast biologist. Okay. And, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, 
Frank, you know, he, he, he willing to answer stupid questions. I have asked him many stupid questions over the years. I have learned things. You know, usually what happens is you can fill a gap. On the other hand, no one would mistake me for a biologist. I can talk to, I can talk to people in biology in an intelligent way about certain aspects of biology, but about how cells work or protein structures or something like that, I don't really know that much. Okay, but that's because I haven't really worked with people on this kind of thing. So I still think in general, trying to make as broad a background as you can is a good thing. Okay, any questions? You know, yeah. Which new paper should you read? Okay, um, I'm gonna say not the Statesman, but uh, which is, that's, a Stony, that's a Stony Brook campus newspaper, and that's a joke. If you read, read the Statesman, but don't expect to learn much about onions in, in that country. Um, I, I am, I, I am a, 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 a big fan of the New York Times. You know, and again, the, the, the best thing is, and, and we still get a printed newspaper for Sunday. Okay, we, up until very recently, we got printed newspapers, even though I read it online more than I should. But, um, but, but again, I go pretty deep into the art, you know, into what they're doing, you know, and try to read a lot of different sections, because I do think that, that the broad background on this is important. Okay. It's important to know who the hottest movie star is now. And it's important to know, um, you know, which team is doing well in sports. And it's important to know what's happening in the business world and that, you know, what, what is, how serious is inflation risks. There's a lot. And so I think breadth is a good thing. Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, okay, what I'd like to now talk about is maybe, um, that's, that's my philosophy section. Um, but now let's get into maybe a little, something a little bit more obviously data science-y. And um, it has to do with the fact that with data science, a lot of it is about asking questions. Um, I will say that if you're a computer scientist and a software developer, in some sense, you're not encouraged to ask questions. In an ideal world, a software developer is often given specs. Here are the specs. What are you supposed to do? You do that. Excuse me, am I supposed? You do that, okay? It's a specification, okay? Now in data science, I think that you, you, you absolutely are, it's, it's critical to be asking questions. It's supposed to be questions about, you know, if you have a data set, what are the exciting things you can do with it, okay? If you're working in a field, what is it that this field cares about? You know, what, what do people really want to know? Okay. So I do think that asking questions is in data science an important thing in a way that uh, it is less true in, um, in you know, many traditional computing fields. So what I'd like to do for the rest of class is to focus on ask, asking questions. Um, and the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to describe four different data sets, one by one, that I think are really cool data sets. And I want us to try to think of what questions you might be able to ask about them. Okay? What could you do about them? And, um, and again, it's going to be a data set on baseball, a data set on movies, a data set on language, and a data set on taxi data in New York. But so let's go try this. The first one is um, baseballreference.com. Okay, now, how many people here are baseball fans? I expect exactly zero. I don't know, on TV, is there anybody who will raise their hand and admit that they're a baseball fan? No one, not yet, okay? Now, I happen to be a baseball fan, okay? And you are supposed to be data scientists who are curious about things, right? What, you might ask, why am I a baseball fan? What is interesting about baseball and stuff like that? It turns out that, um, first of all, baseball is a lot like cricket, at least conceptually. So if you guys are sitting here and you know about cricket, how many of you like cricket? Oh, oh suddenly everybody's twitching. Okay. So in, if you want to think of it like a, it's probably many of these data sets are, an, are probably analogous to cricket. 
But let me just go through um, what is at this particular data set. This data set is about baseball. Baseball is an American sport that's been played professionally for probably about 150 years now. So it goes back quite a ways. Um, this is um, what you would get. They have record on every single person who pl ever played baseball. Who's Babe Ruth? Babe Ruth was like the Sachin Tendulkar of uh, baseball. I and mean, he was, he was, you know, the, the greatest baseball player. Um, and, uh, you know, what does it tell you? It tells you when they were born, where they went to high school. He didn't tell them where he went to college because he flunked out of high school. But uh, tells you uh, what teams he played for, how long did he play, when did he die, where is he buried. It'll tell you what his salary was every year. Again, he played from 1914 to 1930, actually 1935 or so. Um, it will tell you about trades, where he was, you know, baseball players can be traded from one team to another. It's kind of like, you know, I could call, trade you maybe to, you know, uh, Buffalo or something like that. Okay. Um, and so it tells you about every person who's played baseball and ever played professionally. And there's probably been about 20 or 30,000 of them by now. Okay. What else does it tell you? It tells you how, what, the, what, what did they actually do every season they played? This is a, a, a data space where for every year that Babe Ruth played, we know what team he played for. We know how old he was. We know how many games he played and how many hits he got, how many walks. We know how many home runs he hit. Babe Ruth was famous as a home run hitter. Okay, and you can see, in this case, the, the darker ink shows that, the, that he led the league in that category. So you, if you can just see how dark some of these numbers are, you'll know that he was, uh, you know, the best player of his time, okay? So we get this for every single player. My question now is, what could you do with this? Can anybody think of questions you could ask? And I'll give you this data set. Every player, the physical properties of every player, you know, their height, their weight, their handedness, their, uh, you know, where they were born, where they died, okay? I give you their statistical record. What could you do with it? Is there any question you can ask? Yes. Could you find the reaction time of every player? So now a reaction time, I guess one measure of a reaction time. What do you mean by a reaction time exactly? Uh, depending upon the speed of the ball, how fast, how fast they hit. Okay, so you would like to, you might want to impute something about how fast they could react. Okay. 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 So any okay. So properties of this. Now a couple of things in there are interesting that you say. One is it would be interesting to figure out how fast these people threw the ball. Now today in modern baseball, there's more and more data being used, and they collect on every pitch how fast did they throw the ball. Okay. Now in the olden days, Babe Ruth happens to have also been a pitcher back, you know, 100 years ago. And the question of how fast did he throw, that was before they had radar guns and stuff like that. Maybe you could try to infer that, okay? It's not clear to me it's directly present, but maybe that's interesting. Any other questions? Actually, somewhere on TV land, okay? Let's take a look at the TV people. I don't want to neglect you. What did I get here? How does performance relate to salary? Right, you know that uh, <clears throat> that in in the real world, every one of you is hopefully going to get a job. Every one of you is hopefully going to do work for that money. Okay, the question of how good you are and does your salary re relate to your performance or does it relate to other things? How well you negotiate? How uh, you know, you know, other things. Um, it's probably hard to get good performance data about how good a programmer somebody is. But it's easy to get pro good performance data about what a baseball player does, right? So, you know, so that's a perfectly fine thing to study. Do you get paid for what you did today or do you get paid for what you did years ago? Okay, that's an interesting question. What else do I have on the TV land? Let me just answer these people because I think they get neglected. Um, what? Okay, let's stop. Um, 
you know, uh, how does their performance vary according to different months? It's not obvious this data is broken down by months. That might be an interesting thing to want to learn that may or may not be in this data set. The question of who's going to be the next Babe Ruth, okay? What you would really like to do if you are a uh, run a team is to be able to look at players and figure out who's going to be the next giant star, right? And uh, maybe if you did something like look at their first three years of performance, could you compare them to other people's first year, three years of performance? And say, you know, someone that the, the, the 10 players that are most similar to this guy so far, their future performance is great. The 10 players closest to this guy are all bums. Okay. Maybe I can trade the good guy for the bum if the other side does not realize that. Okay. So that seems like something that's good. Okay. What do we need to do? What metric will learn the most money for people? Okay. Again, what are you getting paid because more money because you hit home runs or because you're a good fielder or there was one famous home run hitter who said, who, who, who had, had the quote, home run hitters drive Cadillacs. Cadillacs were fancy cars, right? So, you know, if you, you know, if you wanted to get the money, hit home runs. Okay. That was his idea. What else? What do you need to do to get a home, to, um, what, you, what else do we see here? Um, find a player's kryptonite, okay? Can you figure out when a player, what makes a player not good? Okay, now that you'd like to have data on probably finer grain than what I have here, right? You'd like to know, for example, maybe what pitchers are, uh, that does the batter hit against or not hit against, okay? So it's not, this may be a world where you need a better data set even than this. Okay, any other comments here? Let me go to two others here, yes. The player's what? Age and the performance. And the player's age and performance, okay? So again, what typically happens over the, what is the life um, flow of a baseball player? As a rookie or a kid, you come up, you're probably not that great. You need to learn something, you need to get more experience but you're big and strong and you keep getting better and better until you start to develop a gut and you start to get a little slower. And how does that, what is the curve of players? How do they age? This is probably a good thing to know if you're going to go pay, pay them. Right. Okay. And uh, a lot of things. Okay. So what do I think? I think we got a couple of questions, but let's take a look at it. So first let's look at what questions I came up with. One, you know, there's measures of uh, how do you measure skill? I think a, a lot of people were on that. What's the trajectory with age? That one we talked about. There are different positions. And that um, some, you know, that players on the field, like you guys, again, if you're in cricket, there's some people who, who pitch, they throw the ball, and there's some people who hit it. And there probably uh, are, are, are different roles that people play. Okay, where do you sit on the field? where some are favored for how well they catch the ball and some are just places you hide somebody if they're a great hitter, okay? And how does that affect it? Okay, so those are baseball questions. But let me tell you that there are other questions that are more interesting if you start to think about this. My favorite question that I ever heard addressed with the baseball data set was, do left-handed people have shorter lifespans than right-handed people? Now, let's think about this. How would you, first of all, is it a reasonable question? Who here is left-handed? I'm left-handed. You want to know the answer to this. This is important, right? Now, how would you answer this kind of a question? Okay, it's not obvious where you get data on this. Because what do you need? Could I tell everybody in here um, what you call it, whether they're lefty or righty? You would be willing to tell me that, so that I don't think is a problem. Or could I use this data to figure out how long people are going to live? No, why not? Because you're all still alive, okay? And hopefully that will stay that way for a while. 
<laughs> but you need to have a data set where you know who's lefty and who's righty, and you need to know that they're dead, okay? Or that they naturally would have had a chance to die, okay? And the baseball record, <clears throat> it has been going on for 150 years. The kind of people who keep this record, they care in baseball whether you throw lefty or righty. Did they know, do you know what your, whether your great-grandfather throws lefty or righty? This is the kind of thing that isn't written down for most people. There aren't really records kept on that, right? But the data set from the baseball, people were able to do a meaningful study and decided that left-handers do die earlier than right-handers, okay? Now, how important is that? Well, part of that was deemed, you know, it, it turns out this effect is dissipated, okay? Back then, what did you do after baseball? If you were a, a baseball player from 1900, what do you do after your career was over? You probably go back to the farm and operate heavy equipment designed for right-handers and you fall behind underneath your tractor and get killed or something like that, okay? So, you know, the world is, I think, more friendly to non to lefties now than it used to be. So this is, so don't worry about it. I'm not worried about this and I'm left-handed. But, but this to me is a, a great data science question. It's very clever. It's a clever use of a data set. How often do people return to where they're born? You guys are all from India, right? Not, not all from India, but there's a large number of people here from India. And it's, you know, I don't know what you think of your future life trajectories are, okay? My guess is, without knowing any of you, that you're planning on staying in the U.S. for a while. And many of you sort of say, well, maybe someday I'll go back home. That's, you know, and for some degree of maybe, okay? And what happens? You know, well, you would need to have a data set of where people were born and where they died. And it's not easy to find such a data set, but that's in the baseball thing. And a surprising number of them ended up back where they started, even though they went off into the big city and became big stars in baseball. Um, how are heights and weights changing in the population? You know that you have baseball players over time? Okay, Babe Ruth has a reputation of being very heavy and fat, but, you know, by modern standards, maybe not so, okay? Any other good, exciting questions about baseball? Yeah. Uh, what kind of stats get you transferred to the best team that is like the Yankees? Yankee. Okay, what is it that makes a, makes a team good? I'm going to interpret that as being, how do you get... What players should you, what, what are the characteristics of a, a good team? Um, you might say, well, it's the one with the best players, okay? And that's largely true, but not completely true. As it happens, my favorite team, which I will confess is the San Francisco Giants, this year are, through some kind of an act of God, have the best record in baseball this year. And they're doing it with, 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 seem, with, with players that don't look that good, okay? If you, if you actually take a look at their statistics, there many other teams, they lead the league in home runs without having any player who hits a lot of home runs. How can that be? Everybody hits a, a, a reasonable number. They don't have some big guy who's hitting a huge number. And they seem to be made of spare parts, but somehow the spare parts are fitting together. And that's kind of an interesting thing to study. I can agree with that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move on from baseball now, but I think people get the point again. And I, a great thing for a data scientist to do is to look at a data set and say, what can I do with it? Okay, and you know that's the kind of thinking I wanna encourage. Many of you have undoubtedly seen IMDB, okay? Um, actually, any questions in TV land, including one orally? I'm still seeing everybody zooming in on this thing. Okay. Yes. Thought I heard someone momentarily. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Momentarily, actually. <laughs> any questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, professor, I had a question. 
Okay, you're going to make me want it to be on uh, what you call it, on, on the chat. But try one last time. Yeah, I'm not sure there seems to be some echo. Okay, work, work on that. Work on that. Sorry about that. That's not going to work. Okay, um, let's go on to the next data set, IMDb. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen IMDb at some point. It's the International Movie Database. And um, what does it know? It has details on every single movie that was ever made. This is a movie, It's a Wonderful Life. How many people know what the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? A few of you, this is the best Christmas movie ever made, okay? One should see it, it has a very interesting history. And uh, anyway, um, what does it tell you? It tells you when it, what its title was, when it was made, it tells you who directed it, the writers, who were the stars, it uh, tells you how much money it made, tells you how much the budget was, tells you who made it, uh, how long the movie was, is it color, is it black and white, um, when was it released, stuff like that. So you get all kinds of data about the movie. You also get all kinds of data about the actors. Now, okay, here's the actor star of that was Jimmy Stewart. Okay, he was like the Tom Hanks of his day. Okay. And what do we know? We learn his biography, when he was born and died. We learn, um, you know, uh, uh, what you call it? What, who else was in the movie? The whole character, you know, who played what in the movie? Okay. What could we do with this database? We now know every movie. We now know uh, all kinds of data about the picture. We now know who the cast was, and we know data about the cast. Are there any interesting questions one can ask about the movie? Let me start on the TV thing. Um, okay. Um, so what do we say? One thing is you, could, you would like to use this for recommendation. You would like to be able to try to recommend similar movies. So what that kind of would mean is you would like to have a notion of given the data about each film and a new query film. Could I find the similarity between my query film and a film in the database, okay? And maybe more similar movies means that if you liked one, you'll like the other, right? That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You could look at this thing, what kind of genre dominates which decades, okay? Um, you know, I guess there was a time in like the 50s or 60s when Cowboy films, westerns were very popular in the United States, right? And you don't see very many westerns anymore, right? So maybe there's something you could learn about that. Um, how, how much money the movie will earn? Now, if you are a producer of a film, what do you want to know? Before you make the movie, you'd like to know how much money will this movie make if I make it, right? Once you've made the movie, it's too late, right? You make this movie and it's a bomb, you know, you're stuck with it. You already paid the bills, right? So you'd certainly like to be able to predict it and do that kind of analysis would be good. How does the popularity of the star cast affect its IMDb rating? Do people give better movie, better grades to movies with big stars in it or not? Okay. And then is that an accident? Okay, or is that a cause? That seems like an interesting question. <clears throat> Are movies good because they have stars in it? Or is it that stars may get, get roles in good movies? Anytime a, someone in, in Hollywood says, I'm going to make a good movie, what do they do? They hire Tom Hanks. What do they, you know, what do, they do when they hire an Avengers movie? They, 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 they don't hire Tom Hanks, right? There's some, well, there's some role of, of who hires what. Okay, does the actor make the movie or the movie make the actor? That seems like a good, good question. What else do we see? How much is the, the money the movie makes compared to the budget? Okay, do you need to put a lot of money into the film to make people watch it? Okay, or not? Or is it that if you have a really clever idea, people come to it? Can you predict what the box office is? That seems interesting. Okay. Um, you know, okay, so these kind of questions. Any questions here in, uh, let's see, somewhere else in the room, you back there. Huh? 
Okay, louder, I'm afraid. How are the review states? Okay, so I release dates. Okay, so again, if you're a uh, right now, if you are a James Bond fan, okay, they have been the the the, the they made a James Bond movie like two years ago, but they weren't smart enough to realize that there was going to be COVID and that the world was movie theaters were going to shut down, and now these guys have spent the last two years trying to figure out when do I release this movie. So first of all, so that I get the biggest crowd. Now there's times of the year when people seem to want to go to movies more than other times. February is like death, supposedly, but Christmas is a time when people go to movies. So the question of what is the effect of that on release date? Perfectly good question. Any questions? Okay, last one. Let's try back there, you. The question is about writers, okay? Which writers are best, okay? And does the screenwriter make a difference, okay? You know, that uh, I would like to think that the screenwriter makes a big difference, but I guarantee you they don't get paid like Tom Hanks does, okay? <laughs> so, okay. What were my questions? Again, there are kind of movie questions. Um, you know, again, all this stuff about gross prediction, is a perfectly rational thing. Um, other things that haven't been mentioned that I like is, what about um, the age distribution? How old does it be to, um, what you call it, to be, to be, when is it that, you know, what is the age of people in certain roles? You know, and historically there's been a terrible thing where, you know, women in movies have to be young Men can be old, right? There's nothing wrong with a 60-year-old guy getting the 30-year-old woman, right? <laughs> but, um, but you know, but you know, you would have people, you know, you know, sometimes you'd have, you know, um, you know, a man and a woman, and they'd be the same age, and one would play the mother, okay? <laughs> and you know, how much is that? Is that changing? That seems like an interesting question. Um. I think questions about lifespan come to mind. You know, you're used to um, movie stars imploding at a young age and they, they go and they do drugs or something like that and that's the end of them. Um, is this true? Do stars live longer lives than bit players? Seems to me to be a perfectly rational thing. Is that changing? Okay, that seems interesting. You know, looking at what the social network is like, you know, that... Um, one interesting thing about movies is you have that actors play, uh, you know, presumably when you're on a movie, you get to know the people who you're making the movie with. And you can now define a network where the vertices are people and there's an edge of two people are in the same movie together, okay? And then you can start to look at this network, okay? How, what are the properties of it? And again, there was a famous game called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where somehow they, this guy had theorized that Kevin Bacon was an actor who was the most central person. Everybody was either Kevin Bacon or in a movie with Kevin Bacon or in a movie with someone that Kevin Bacon was in a movie with, okay? And, you know, studying these properties, supposedly Samuel L. Jackson is now the most central actor that he seemingly has worked with everybody and uh hasn't worked with me but uh but that's beside the point any other questions or any other burning questions about movies yeah okay you couldn't hear that one okay so there's some question of consistency of performance that you'd probably like okay if you're making movies, you're trying to predict how will financially this movie do? Is this director constantly able to bang out reasonable per hits? Or does this director, um, you know, what he got lucky with one and then they produced a bomb? Okay, you want to know about that. Okay, so the movie database, I think, is clear. There's interesting data there. Any questions? Yeah. How do today's generations perceive uh, the old films so that they can be re -re 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 and make Okay, how do um, the, the, the today's generation perceive follow old movies? Actually, that's an interesting question to me personally. 
How many people here have ever seen Casablanca? One, two, three, okay. I think that is the greatest, the best movie ever made. Not the greatest, but the best, okay? And I am kind of curious how that would be play among people like you if you sat down and watched it. Would you understand that it was the best movie ever made, okay? That seems like a good, good kind of question. To what extent, and, and again, maybe how would you answer that from the data set is really the interesting question. And I don't know. I mean, there are comments and reviews, right, for every movie on IMDb. You have data from people who, you know, who, who, what did they, get, rating did they give? Maybe if you could guess how, what the age of these people are, you know, you might be able to get something like that. Okay. And uh, how would you guess what the age they are? That's an interesting question. Maybe by what other movies they watch, right? So anyway, that's an interesting question. Okay, let's take a, uh, another, um, what you call it? Um, what you, let's take a look at another uh, data set that I like a lot, which is, I mentioned actually in the first lecture, the Google Ngrams data. Remember I showed you this picture that showed how much computer science there was as a function of time or how much, you know, data science, data, da you, know, you know, data processing and things like that. So what is the Google Ngrams data? First, I encourage you to go to look for, you know, not right now, but you know, or if you're bored in lecture, Google, Google Ngrams, okay? And uh, you'll find it. Um, what they will do is they, they will have, a, be able to give you a time series of for every phrase that is popular, popular means it occurred more than 40 times in history, okay? Um, in scanned books, okay? How many times did it occur each year? Normalized by the number of books they have. So it gives you an idea of how, what the frequency it is used in the language, okay? And they do this for all phrases of length up to five, if they occur at least 40 times. Stephen Skeena has probably occurred, okay, at least 40 times in books, okay? You know, you could probably see that, but, they, but you could do this for any word or phrase that's occurred at least 40 times, okay? And like I said, Google had scanned a sizable fraction of the, of the world's books. When last I checked, it was about 15% of all the books ever published, okay? So what do you do if you have, what could you do? What kind of questions could you ask if you have this data about words? How often words appear in books? Any ideas? Okay, you. What kind of words in the book would have uh, an effect on the sales of the book? Okay, you would like to say what kind of words have, would have an effect on this uh, sales of the book? So you might say, do books with the, would it have contain the phrase, buy this book, does that make their sales go up? That would be nice to know, but you don't have that information here. You don't have the full text of the books. You have, and the books have been kind of run through a blender, right? You only know how often these words have occurred in books. So I don't think you could do that kind of a study. Any other ideas? Okay, uh, just on TV land, people are talking about what popular subjects are popular for a span of time. That's exactly right. We're, if you look at the word cowboy, we were talking about Westerns have probably become less popular. Were there more books talking about cowboys than they were back then, than they are now? And I bet the answer is yes. Okay, so I think that's an interesting use. What do you think? Is what language? Slang. So, so you might want to say is, is there an increase in the amount of slang used? Okay, if you have a sense of what words are slang, you could count how often they occur. Okay. I don't, slang, what, what exactly you mean by slang has to be defined, okay? And I, you know, so, but, but again, there's no reason why you couldn't do a study like that if you came up with a list of all the terms that are ruled slang, okay? Anything else? What else do I see here? Um, okay, uh, what are the most commonly used phrases, okay? 
So again, you know what the most commonly used phrase probably is? The. Okay, now the question is, you know, you probably want to know for longer phrases, what word phrases are used unusually. You might say what phrases are used more than the under, you would expect given the underlying words. Okay, and that that's actually an, an interesting kind of question. Um, what else do I see? I hear someone saying something about training something for auto, auto text completion. Okay. That will give you what you know how what words are being used and how often they're being used. Okay, that would be interesting. Would there be a problem training, um, you know, the autocomplete for your cell phone on books? Okay, what kind of problem would there be? When we type in use our phone. Kind of you you what you have in books isn't what's what what uh, on you type i see people typing in everything is lol 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 okay you don't have that in the book right so there's a question of whether it's the best um data set for that kind of a thing but that seems like a reasonable thing what other things do i see here can you see the evolution of popular words with with similar meanings what words come and go and why they come and go is a very interesting question. And this clearly would give you that kind of a background for something like that. So what kind of questions did I come up with here? Oh, actually, here's the picture, the typical picture of what you get from Google Engrams. This was measuring for Frankenstein, Albert Einstein, and Sherlock Holmes. How much were they talked about in books? Now, what do we know? Frankenstein got talked about before Albert Einstein. Why was that? Because the book was written, Frankenstein was written in like 1820 or so, right? And, and they didn't invent Albert Einstein till about 1900, okay? But, um, Suddenly, somehow Frankenstein became popular around 1960. It started becoming more, people talk, started talking more and more about Frankenstein. Any idea why that was? You say because of the movie? Well, the important movie was for Frankenstein was in the 30s, so that one's not going to do it. Any other reason? Yeah. What? The rise of AI and technology as a metaphor, it started being coming, people started talking about Frankenstein as this technology that, you know, got out of control and had to be, you know, destroyed on some level. And as you started developing more and more technology, okay, this is the kind of thing people started worrying about. So it became a metaphor. That's something you could see here. And, um, you know, anyway, so you can do this with all. What were the questions I asked? One question I was, would be curious about is how much cursing is there? This is a little bit like slang. It's the same thing, except I guess the good thing about cursing, there's only a small number of really good curse words, okay? <laughs> so you could easily make a list of this thing and see how much has it changed. My guess is that there's probably about as much cursing as ever, but it's probably more in books now than it used to be, right? You couldn't, you couldn't put it in books in the old days. Um, and we talked about this. How does lifespan of technologies? How does that change? How do new words come out and building language models and things like that? So this is a wonderful data set. I know we've used it in a lot of projects and stuff like that. Anything else about uh, Google Ngrams you can think about? Again, the greatest things, that, the thing I get most excited about in data science is actually when someone finds a data set and makes it do something that it wasn't really intended to do. If you have a really good data set, you know, you can ask interesting questions about it. And, you know, it, it can tell you about things that are seemingly broader than what, what was just there. Okay, the final data set that I'd like to talk about today has to do with the New York taxi data. I don't know how many people have made it to Manhattan so far. Some, but not all. I strongly recommend it. It's, you know. Um, and when you're in there, 
Um, one way that you get around is you're going to, I encourage you to use the subway, um, but, but people often use taxis. And um, the taxis in New York are yellow or green. And it turns out the green taxis have different properties than yellow taxis. It makes a difference. But usually the ones that you'll first see are, are, are yellow. Um, but whenever you get into a taxi, these days in an official medallion taxi, there is a machine that is going to monitor basically the fares, okay? And that there'll be a clock. When you get in the taxi, they push the button, the clock goes on, and it charges you as a function of how far, how far you drove and how long you were in the taxi. So there's an algorithm that maps these, this quantity to a, a, a fare. And it turns out that New York City keeps track of this data for every single taxi ride, from every single medallion taxi cab. Not Uber, because that's a private thing, and we'll deal with Uber some other time. But um, one thing that was interesting was, this is data that is run, kept by the city. In, there are laws called the Freedom of Information Act, where you can request data from government sources, and unless there are privacy issues or something like this, they have to give it to you. And someone obtained for basically this data of all the taxi cab data, every ride for several years in this city, okay, through a Freedom of Information Act request. And what do you know? You learn what the medallion, that means what was the cab that was doing it, the ride, hack license, is the ID of the driver. You know, when they picked you up, when they dropped you off, how many passengers were in the car? Um, what was the time of the trip? How long did it take? How far did you go? This must be in seconds, I guess. How far did you go? That's probably miles. Where were you picked up? Longitude and latitude, where were you dropped off? Okay. And it also tells you for the fare, how much did they charge you? Sometimes they give you a surcharge for various times that they charge more for it. They give you a tip amount. Did anybody tip? Did they ride through a thing where they had to pay tolls? Things like that. So what would you do if you had this data on every taxi ride from in the city of New York for a couple of years? Okay, yes. Identify the what? Could you identify the address of a person? Now, this, of course, would be a bad thing if you could, okay? <laughs> because this is supposed to, one of the reasons they, they give this data is to try to make it anonymous. You know, is privacy is a, would be a problem, right? So do, could you figure out the address of, this, of somebody from this data? Let's think about that. Who here thinks they can? Tell me how you could do it, yeah? Pick, pick up time. Okay, so if you knew where somebody was, okay, when they took a cab, right? So let's say I wanted to find your, your, your address, okay? What could I do if I was following you around, okay? And I saw you get into a cab, I would say, aha, you got in at this time, at this place, right? Now I could then look up the record. What was the cab that picked up at this time in this place? Okay. So it's not directly in the data that you think. But maybe you can, you know, you can use some other data set for this. An example of this is actually something that they did with celebrities. You know, when they saw, you know, what you call it, the, uh, you know, you, you have Leonardo DiCaprio comes to, uh, you know, his, his cab drops him off at some nightclub, right? With, you know, with, with some woman, okay? Where were they before this, right? I know, where, I know what cab it was. I know uh, what time he arrived, okay? And maybe you can use something to try to invert that, okay? That's one of the problems, by the way. We're, you know, we're, I, I'm not gonna, maybe, uh, maybe I'll talk about the end of the class, but of course, but that's, a problem that it's very hard to completely anonymize data sets, especially if you use auxiliary data, okay? 
What else do I see here? Anybody? Uh, okay, and TV land, just quickly. What are the busiest uh, times and places for getting cabs, right? That might be interesting if I'm going to be a cab driver. Where do I want to go get a wait for somebody to pick me up? Where there are riders, right? Ideally, riders were going to go all the way to Brooklyn or something so I can take it, give them a nice big ride, right? Um, how does the holiday or festival make a difference, right? If you know basically how, how, what time of the day do people care about? What calendar days are there? What is the single time in New York, in New York City when the most people want a cab? Does anybody figure that out? New Year's, right? 1201 New Year's Day, right after the ball drops in Manhattan. Then everybody wants out, okay? So, so that's when it's probably the most popular time, except that there may not be that many cab drivers on the road or something like that, okay? What other things do we care about? Um, what places are avoided by taxi cabs? Now, that's actually an interesting question. Um, remember I told you there's a difference between green taxis and yellow taxis? Why is there a difference between green taxis and yellow taxis? Turns out you need a license to get, you know, um, the license to run a traditional yellow cab is extremely hard to get. You have to pay, you know, the Uber has given them a hit, but it, at one point it was a quarter million dollars to uh, get the right to run a, to own a cab, okay? You pay for the car, the car was $20,000. The piece of plastic they, sta they stapled to the roof of, to the um, front trunk, you know, the, 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 the door of the uh, front. What, minute, what do we call it? In the front of the cab, you know, there's a hood, the hood, okay? That's the medallion. That would cost a quarter million dollars. Now, people who did this were serving where the rich people were, okay? And you didn't get cabs in not so good neighborhoods. So you can get a medallion to run a green taxi, okay? In um, what you call it, much less. But the green taxi, there's rules about how many times you can pick people up in, you know, the lower part of Manhattan. A green taxi is designed to ride in the top, upper part of Manhattan. And the reason is because there's underserved areas, okay? You know, and uh, that's a problem. So, yeah, you should be able to get sense on that. What other things do I see here? Um, you know, it could help taxi drivers figure out where they should go and what time they should work, okay? Where do they get good tips? Is there a part of town where people tip easily and a part of town where they don't. Actually, we once did a study of this. We made a tipping map of the city. And, uh, you know, there's parts of the contact, parts of the city are generous and parts of the city aren't. Okay. Any questions here? Any other things to do with taxis? I want a new, I don't think you, I haven't heard from. Yeah, you. Um, you could detect faulty meters by seeing outliers in the data. You're going to detect what? Faulty taxi, faulty taxi meters. So now, um, why would a taxi meter be faulty? Well, it's possible it just breaks, but you know, if you if if you don't believe that, you're probably don't not going to last in New York very long. Um, <laughs> sometimes there is chicanery where, you know, a you know, if let's say you look like a person from out of town, okay. They would like you to drive, um, what you call it? Oh, you want to drive to this location? Turns out you're going to have to go through California. Let me go drive you. And it's, you know, it's going to take us two hours tonight to get to this location. Okay. And uh, so some question of, to a certain extent, looking for, you know, routes that are, uh, that seemingly are a lot longer than they should be for where, where the start and stop is. Certainly seems interesting. And, um, you know, that will tell you something about the behavior of the driver at the very least. Okay. What were my questions? Let's just take a look at this. I'd be interested in how much money do drivers make each night? Okay. You know, being a taxi driver is a, you know, taxi drivers work for their money. You know, they have 12 hour shifts typically. Uh, you know, I'd be curious to know what they make. 
I think the general rule is they supposedly keep the tips and they get half of what the money is. Okay, I'd like to know. I'd like to know how much mileage does a taxi driver get? Actually, I'll confess, I just was, um, you know, I, I, we had an old car and I just, you know, sold it to someone. And uh, that someone is in the city and that someone um, runs delivery services. And, you know, he was saying, well, in order to be reliable, you know, you really need, if you're going to be driving an Uber car, it's got to be reliable because it's going to be driving all day. If you're making pizza deliveries, pizza deliveries happen all day. You know, the normal car, you know, you drive for to work, you can have it sit for a while. You know, something about um, how far do taxis travel? That's something I'm curious about. How does tra traffic affect? One thing that's interesting is that this taxi data is really a sensor device for traffic, okay? There's gonna be times when the route from A to B takes a lot longer than it usually does. If you wanna know, you know, again, the city is not instrumented to tell you how much traffic there is at any given road at any given time. But if you have taxis running around, and you analyze this data, you should definitely be able to figure out what roads are crowded when, okay? When is there a, a terrible jam, okay? This is actually very, very interesting. You can use these things as sensor devices for taxi, for traffic. Understanding where people travel, where do people want taxis? My guess is that during the morning, People want taxis from where people live to where people work, right? And in the late afternoon, they want to go from where they work to where they live. And on weekends, they want to go from where they live to where they, you know, where they party or something like that. Okay? But trying to figure these things out are, are interesting. Okay? Do faster taxi drivers get tipped better? This to me seems kind of interesting. The usual reason why you tip a taxi driver is either they're friendly, well, but that doesn't happen, or you reward them for knowing the right way through the traffic to get there, okay? And this would be the kind of thing that'd be interesting, okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about taxis or uh, anything else to do with taxi data sets? Okay. Uh, hello, yeah. professor. Good, yes. Yes. I think from the data, we can find out the features about the uh, taxi driver, such as he's fast and he's humble. So that option given to the, we can give to the customers who are using. Okay, well, you would such like as, to give it the mm -hmm. taxi, you think that the customer, you would like mm -hmm. it to be the case that if you got into a taxi, the taxi driver mm -hmm. would be able to tell you when you're going to get to your destination. Is that what you were saying? Some, no, uh, I'm saying like that uh, from the data, we can find out that uh, this taxi uh, driver is humble, this taxi driver is fast, this taxi is quick driver. This I see, you'd like driver. to score the taxi uh, driver, okay? Yes, and you'd like to like be that. able to know, okay? Mm. You know, if you take my cab, okay? I am a fast but dangerous driver, okay? <laughs> I am a slow but expensive, but, but safe but expensive driver, things like that. You could certainly score the drivers, and based on the scores, maybe that's a service you'd like to make available to people. There's a question yes. on the, the link. Yeah, oh, that's good. A question on the link about how does weather affect the fares? Now, in, in an Uber world, okay, the fares are affected by weather, okay? In a New York time taxi thing, all that's affected by weather is how long it takes you to get, get there, right? So how does, how does the speed change as, and the traffic change as a function of weather, okay? That's certainly a concern. And one thing I, I didn't put here, I'd like to be known, again, okay, the data set goes back far enough to be kind of pre-Uber. How did Uber, you know, the advent of Uber change things? You know, Uber made things a lot tougher if you're a cab driver, okay? And, uh, you know, and, and, and this is a, a problem in certain, in, in many ways. It causes a lot of instability in the tax, taxi system, okay? What do you see from the data there? Anything else? I think I got one more, one more, 
question. Let's see. You. What is the inflation rate for the taxis? What is the inflation rate for the taxis? Okay, I'm not sure I know what that means. Uh, how are the fares changing with the time? How do fares change with time? You could find that out. Actually, it turns out that taxi fares are regulated by the taxi commission. So each taxi does not get to charge what it wants. There are very much tight rules on what you have to charge. Okay. And so, um, so I would probably not go to that for, you know, there's a, you know, I would probably go back to the source data rather than that. Okay. Last one. Yes. So based on traffic, could you learn a, a where to put a uh, store? Okay. Well, you would know something about the traffic flow by cars. Now, depending upon in New York City, do you want to put a, a uh, what you call it, a uh, store near where there's a lot of taxis going by? Maybe if people are picking up and dropped off there, but more likely, I think you're going to see, or may, maybe, maybe, I, I, as I understand how people use taxis in the city, okay, they're probably not going to get dropped off and suddenly see a store. They were dropped them off for a reason in a particular area, but maybe, it, anyway, it's a fair thing to say. Okay, and uh, okay, last thing, taking a look at uh, this, just to say quickly, do they make more money in peak hours when they have a lot of customers or in the off peak? Okay. That's a good question. Again, if you're a taxi driver, turns out the taxi drivers have a property in Manhattan that they start work at five and they end at five. Everybody works a 12 hour shift. This is why if you try to get a taxi at 5 PM, can you get a taxi in the city at 5 PM? Turns out to be very, very hard because they're trying to shuttle the taxi back to where there's less taxis on the road then because people are trying to switch drivers. Okay. And, um, you know, so the question of who makes more money, the night shift or the, the day shift, that would be interesting. Okay. You guys get the idea. We want to think, look at things and be able to ask questions about data sets. And that's where I'm going to end today. Okay, thanks for your attention. I will see you guys next class. In the meantime, your homework one is now out, which is about watching the videos. Go ahead and play with that. And uh, I'll talk to you guys on Tuesday. Uh, professor? Yes. Oh, um, so for the homework one, so are we picking four episodes among the eight and then give a review on the read, read what the assignment says two of the assigned episodes will be from um based on your id number and two of them are your choice uh so based on id number i couldn't really understand because uh for example my id number in the end is uh zero seven but i couldn't find that digit on the syllabus I okay mean, you should have the last two digits of your id number for your student ID number, that is, that is going to bucket you based on which 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 things you should run. Oh, if so I, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, so there are four digits in each of the episodes, and I couldn't find the one that matched my last digit ID number. So I was kind of confused. No, 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 no. I think you take the last two digits, mm -hmm. and that buckets it. That gives you a number from one to a hundred. Divide that by four, and that will give you what bucket you're in. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Ask on Piazza. Ask on right, Piazza. Yeah. Okay, thank that's you. That's the kind of thing we will figure. Someone will answer. Okay? Okay, thank fair you. enough. Okay, bye-bye. I'll see. Anything else? Oh, sure. Okay, bye-bye, y'all.